There's an old chorus, if you know it, sing it with me. It goes like this. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. My wife and I have just been so privileged to be amongst the people that long for Jesus as evidently as you do. And Jesus will honor those seeking hearts and he will reveal himself to you. And soon, we are going to see the king. When I was seven years old, I went to boarding school. My parents were missionaries in Kenya, East Africa. The school would last for three months and then one month home. It was a good school, I liked it. I learned a lot of things. I learned to play rugby and cricket and field hockey, all the British sports. I learned about the Boy Scouts and speaking French and Latin in the fourth and fifth grades. Wonderful experience, music, drama, all kinds of activities. And as wonderful as school was, it wasn't home. And so at the end of that three month term, I'd get my little travel bag and I'd run and sit on the stone steps of school. And I'd fix my eyes on the bend around which my father would come because I just wanted to go home. My little heart wanted to go home. And now, almost 50 years later, my little heart still wants to go home. I do not belong in this world and neither do you if you bear the name of Christ. This is not our home. We are pilgrims. We are strangers. We are aliens. We are just passing through. I am a missionary because I want to go home. It is my belief this morning that sitting in this room are some men and women that God is calling also to be missionaries because you want to go home. And all through the ages, men and women of God have prayed the prayer that we so eloquently sang this morning. It is one of the very few Hebrew phrases that is not translated in the Greek versions of the New Testament because everybody knew what it meant. Maranatha, our Lord come. And that prayer has been prayed for 2,000 centuries. Jesus, come and take us home. Our world is broken, it is deceitful, it is wicked, and it's not getting better, nor will it. With all the advances in science and education and industry, we're just better at greed, better at killing one another, better at being selfish, and none of this will be broken. These cycles of sin and decadence, it's only going to get worse until that great day when the trumpet sounds and the sky recedes and the Lord descends. And in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. And death will be swallowed up by life. And we will put on the incorruption. And we will evermore be with the Lord. I long for that day. And the Spirit longs with all the people of God through all the centuries of time that the King would come. And the new creation would be restored. And we would ever be with our Lord. But the Bible is very clear that the path to that day goes through the nations. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to every nation and then the end will come. Therefore, for all those who long for his appearing, missions is not optional. And every single one of us must play our part for the gospel to go to the ends of the earth so that the longing of our heart, what we have prayed for this morning, what we have sung over this morning, would be realized and the king would come in power and glory. But it is connected to the globalization, the, the evangelization of the world. And everyone has a part to play with that, even as Jesus did. John 20 verse 21 says, we are sent as Jesus was sent. And so very simply today, 
I want to look at three ways Jesus was sent and ask that we would follow in those steps. We see that Jesus was sent to fight and Jesus was sent to bleed and Jesus was sent to pray. Mark chapter 11, it is the last week in the life of Christ. He has set his face as a flint to go to Jerusalem. He has resisted all of the manipulations even of his own followers to fix the world as they knew it, to deal with the Romans, to become a political king. And he shows that he's not about changing policy. He's not even about politics. He's about something much greater, to die for the sins of the world. And inflamed with that passion to make a redemptive sacrifice for all the nations, every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, he enters the temple, the institution that God had created to be worshipped by man and not just by Israelites because you remember the makeup of the temple, the holiest of holies, only one man once a year, the high priest, the holy place where the priest would minister, Jewish men, Jewish women, but the outermost court was called the court of the Gentiles. It was the biggest. It was the place that Jehovah had ordained that those from Iraq and those from Iran and those from Turkey and those from Libya and those from Egypt, they could come to Mount Zion and they could meet the God of Israel. And when Jesus, full of that passion to die for the sins of the world, goes into his house, the place he had designed for all the nations to meet with him, what does he find in the court of the Gentiles? a marketplace people are buying and selling there's all kinds of this greed and confusion going on all of the pretenses of spirituality all of the noise and all of the confusion and all of the t-shirts and all the propaganda and all the programs and all that stuff that Jesus isn't really interested in and he gets upset it's the angriest we've ever seen Jesus in the gospels And I don't know what your picture of Jesus is, but he's not white, and he doesn't have feathered hair, and he doesn't walk around with the lamb on his shoulders all the time. And Jesus gets violent. He's knocking things around, and he's throwing tables over. And we don't know exactly what he did, if he actually laid hands on people or not, but this we know, the text says, he drove them from the temple. Now, I grew up in Africa. I live in the Middle East the last 30 years, been in a lot of markets. If some of you have been to Latin America or the third world, you know what I'm talking about. A market is colorful. There's spices. There's noises. There's confusion. There's used clothes being sold. There's chickens. There's goats. There's stolen cell phones on the cheap. All of this stuff is going on there. And do you think it would work for you to walk into that crowded marketplace and say, Oh, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Would you please take all your wares and exit stage left because we kind of need this place for prayer. Think that would work? Jesus drove him from the temple. He got violent. He got visceral. And he quotes Isaiah 56, which you have on your wall. Don't let the foreigners say there's no place for me in God's house. Don't let the eunuch say, here I am, a dry tree. For even in my house will be given to them a place greater than sons and daughters. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. We see in Jesus what I call apostolic nasty. Now I don't mean gross or crude when I say that word nasty. Let me use a sports metaphor to explain it. You heard about Michael Jordan? You know the name Kobe Bryant? You know the name Tiger Woods? You know the name Muhammad Ali? You know the name Tom Brady? All of these were incredible athletes, but they did things that others have not done. They won multiple championships at the top of their game. And what made them different from everyone else? You know, at that top level of professional sports, everybody's good. Everybody's athletic. Everybody was the best in their high school and the best in their college, drafted, and they all have the same coaching. They all have the same nutrition experts. They all have the same workout regimens. What made all those guys win all those championships? They had a little bit of nasty. And they weren't just going to win you on the final. They were going to beat you in practice. They were going to beat you to the bus. They were going to beat you at tiddlywinks. And they were going to enjoy doing it, right? They had something up here that made them a little bit nasty. I think it's time, again, in the household of faith, for us to capture a little bit of nasty. A little bit of apostolic nasty. And let me define it this way. 
a consecrated, not a carnal, a consecrated edginess that fixates on Jesus and his glory in all the earth. And that if anything gets in the way of that, you run it over. That's what Jesus did in his house, and remember, it's his house. And what I'm saying here is not that you go mess with other people and that you're grumpy towards other people. I'm just asking you, in the temple that you steward, in the house that's under your authority, where you are in control, what's in that house? And is it retarding the glory of God in all the nations? What's in your mind? What's in your heart? How do you spend your time? What do you watch on Netflix? What's on your phone? And if anything of that does not give glory to Jesus and pursue his fame in all of the nations, You got to get rid of it. You got to get nasty. You got to throw that thing around. You got to get violent. You got to get visceral. This is not the time for games. This is not the time for compromise. We got to go after that thing. We got to cleanse that temple. Your temple. Don't mess with somebody else's. And get your heart completely aligned with the heart of God, which is to die for the nations of the world. We see the same thing in Paul. We know that Paul had a little bit of nasty before he got converted. He's seeking out Christians. He's throwing them into prison. He's killing them. And then we kind of think that after that Damascus Road conversion experience that he got all nice. You know, when you get saved, your personality doesn't change. (laughs) Refined, sanctified, consecrated, yes. And we think of Paul post-conversion Maybe in the 1 Corinthians 13 light that he wrote, love is kind, love is gentle. And we maybe think he got wimpy. He didn't. Same guy that wrote 1 Corinthians wrote Galatians. You foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you to so soon leave the gospel of grace and follow another gospel? You might as well go the whole way and castrate yourself. In the Bible, brother, don't get mad at me. Right? I rebuke Peter to his face. When he tried to switch up the gospel, no longer eating with the Gentiles, getting all confused, I rebuked him to his face. The leader of the Sanhedrin, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. John Mark, when he wasn't on mission, was when he wasn't focused on the Gentiles, off the team, two brothers causing trouble in the church, turn them over to Satan for the destruction of their their, their flesh. It's in there. This guy's not balanced, right? He's still got a little bit of nasty. And whenever anyone got in the way of gospel advance to all the nations, Paul ran them over. Same guy that wrote, love is, love is, love is. Apostolic nasty. A consecrated edginess that focuses on the worth of Jesus and his glory amongst all people. And we run over anything that's in the way of that. You might be thinking, good for Jesus, son of God, good for Paul, greatest missionary that ever lived, but I'm just a mom at home with little kids. Some time ago, my wife and I were in the country of Oman, where Satan has his throne. It's in the Arabian Peninsula. There's so few indigenous believers. In fact, there's probably more Starbucks in the country than there are local believers. We were staying with a missionary family, got up one morning, went into the kitchen, and There was this young mom, she had a little toddler in a high chair, eating Cheerios, one Cheerio cutely stuck in the little toddler's head. Worship music, kids praise, coming across the player and light streaming through the window, a very nice little domestic scene. And I looked over at the sink where there was white ceramic tile and there that young mother had written in her elegant cursive, it's wartime. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter where you live. doesn't matter if you're male or female or young or old or black or white or Hispanic. doesn't matter. We are to fight as Jesus fought for his glory in all the earth. And that should be a fire that burns in our bellies. Why? So we can go home. We fight as Jesus fought. We also bleed as Jesus bled. The United Arab Emirates, 
It's where Dubai is, where Abu Dhabi was formed in about 1972 into a country. Before that, it was called the Trucial States because all these little tribes with their leaders called a sheikh or an emir, they formed a truce with England for political protection. And in 1960, two missionary doctors married to one another named the Kennedys. They went to the Trucial States, rented an old Land Rover, and drove out into the desert. They came to a town of about 1,500 people, or a catchment area. It was an oasis. And there they found a woman who was struggling to give birth. She'd been in delivery trials for three days. They diagnosed that her bladder was so distended with urine that she couldn't deliver the baby, but they didn't have their medical instruments. And so Dr. Kennedy, the man, he went to that Land Rover, popped open the hood, looked around in that engine for the smallest diameter hose he could find, cut it out, made a catheter, inserted it in the lady, drained her bladder so that his wife could deliver a healthy little baby. The sheikh, the, the chief of that area, was so impressed with that, he said, I know who you are, I know you're missionaries, I know you believe things different than us, but you just saved this woman's life and the baby. I give you permission to start a clinic here. Come save the lives of our women and our children. So they did. You might know that when a Muslim baby is born, the very first words intentionally that are whispered in the ear of that Muslim child is what is called the Shahada, the Muslim Confession of Faith, which says, I confess that there's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. Well, Dr. Kennedy, the woman, when she would deliver those Muslim babies, would lift them up and whisper in their ear, but a very different prayer. <laughs> and then she would go visit those babies in their homes at week one and month two and six and nine in a year and tell Bible stories to the moms and the children. And those little children that were prayed over in the name of Jesus and then visited in their homes by the Kennedys, grew up to do some interesting things. For you see, the sheikh, the chief that gave them permission to do that little clinic became the founder of the United Arab Emirates. His name is Sheikh Zaid. And one of the very first babies that Dr. Kennedy delivered was his son named Muhammad. And Muhammad bin Zaid is now the crown prince of Abu Dhabi, the richest of all the emirates. Last year, he was voted the most powerful Arab in the whole world. He's behind the tolerance coming out of the Emirates. He has discipled the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. And that's where we live. Saudi Arabia is a different country as the crown prince is opening up for all kinds of wonderful things. He's behind the peace agreements that are being signed with Israel by some Arab countries. And that little boy, Muhammad, was born into the arms of Dr. Kennedy, prayed over in the name of Jesus, and has grown up to change his world. And here's my point. Amen. Why do I tell that story under this point of bleeding as Jesus bled? You see, in the early days of that clinic, they didn't have generators or fridges, and so they didn't have a blood bank. The staff at that clinic, which has become a hospital named after the Kennedys, under the protection of the crown prince, scripture verses on the door, Bibles given out in the waiting rooms, those Emiratis coming from all across the Gulf for medical care still get the gospel all of these years later. But at the beginning, when it was very humble, they just would make a list of their blood types and post it on the wall, and whatever blood was necessary, the staff would donate. And Dr. Kennedy, the woman, was O negative, universal donor. So she gave more blood than anybody else. In fact, they tell the story. One time she was operating on a lady. The lady began to hemorrhage, so she scrubbed out, gave her own blood, saved the woman's life, scrubbed back in, and delivered a healthy baby. And here's the point of all of that. She did things like this so often that the record of her life is that she lived anemic. She gave out so much of her blood, she was always tired and she was always weak so that Muslim women could be saved, that Muslim babies could be born, that Muslim children could be prayed over in the name of Jesus, that Muslim homes could be visited and the Bible explained so that those Muslim children could grow up and have a chance at eternal life and however they ended up to impact their world for the gospel. So are you willing to live anemic? Are you willing to shed a little bit of blood? In Philippians 3.10, we have a very interesting verse. You all know it, and you probably all like the first half and don't know what to do with the second. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and 
the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, so that by any means I may attain the resurrection of the dead. What's the context for the sufferings of Jesus? Dying for the sins of the world. It is that suffering that Paul says, I want to know Jesus and the fellowship of suffering with him for the sins of the world. For you see, there is a knowledge of God that cannot be gained at this altar, no matter how long you sing. It cannot be found amongst the household of faith. It can't be discovered in a Bible study. But only when you leave home and the comfort of Christian fellowship and you go across the world and you go to some dark town or dark tribe and you live out your faith for Jesus and suffer for it. There's a knowledge of God there that cannot be found anywhere else. Do not feel sorry for the persecuted church. Do not feel sorry for missionaries who work amongst the unreached. They know Jesus in a way that you don't. You should have a holy jealousy that rises up in your heart and says, I want to know, like Paul said, I want to know Jesus that way in the fellowship of his sufferings for the redemption of the world. Not because you're Republican, not because you're white, not because you're anti-vax, not because of this, that, or the other, but because you are suffering for Jesus and the cause of the redemption of the nations. There is a knowledge of God there that cannot be found anywhere else. So when we talk about bleeding, as Jesus bled and living anemic and living tired, oh friends, there's a beauty there. There's a gift in that. Do not fear it. Do not resent it. Don't live in this prosperity nonsense, but enter into the crucifixion of Christ and know him in a way that you cannot know him otherwise. You see this in the life of Paul, too, in Acts chapter 16. He goes to Philippi. Lydia gets saved. A servant girl who's telling the future by demonic, demonic power is liberated. Her handlers get upset. Those marketeers go to the magistrates. We've lost our, our income. Those magistrates take Paul and Silas, beat them, shed us some of their blood, and then chain them to a prison wall. Earthquake, Philippian jailer's family gets saved. And at the end of all of that, the magistrates realize they made a mistake. So they come and kind of cap in hand say to Paul, please leave our city. And he says, no, I'm a Roman citizen. What's going on here? Culturally, in Roman civilization, there was patrons and clients. Patrons had the power. They would give some kind of offering or blessing, and then clients would give them obedience. At the beginning of this story in Acts chapter 16, who has the power? The magistrates. They beat Paul and Silas and put them in prison. But Roman law dictated that a Roman citizen could not be tried or could not be beaten or imprisoned without due process. Our law derives from that Roman law. You could not lift a finger against a Roman without trial. They didn't know he was Roman. Now there's a power inversion. Now Paul has the power and the magistrates are in trouble. All he has to do is report on them to the governor. They lose their job, they lose their income, they lose their honor, they lose their status. But the question is this. With that legitimate get out of jail free card that Paul had, why didn't he play it before they beat him? Why didn't he play it before they chained him to a prison wall? Why didn't he just say, uh-uh, I'm a Roman, you can't even touch me. We gotta have a trial. Why did he wait till after he bled to play the card? I think the answer is given for us in the last verse of Acts 16 where we see right before Paul leaves town, he goes to Lydia's house. Why does he do that? He's conveying his status on her. He's saying to the magistrates, see this woman? See the church in her house? She's with me. I'm leaving town, but if you lift one finger to touch my girl and that church in her house, I'm coming back, I'll report you to the governor, and life as you know, it's over. Don't lift a finger against her or the church. She's under my authority. Wouldn't have been able to do that if he played the Roman card. 
Philippian jailer and his household wouldn't have been safe. No earthquake if he would have played the Roman card. But because he laid down his privilege, Lydia and the church can survive and the Philippian jailer and his family can be saved. What card do you hold? What privilege do you have? I'm not saying it was sinful to be Roman. I'm just saying he was willing to lay it down and bleed a little bit for the sake of the gospel. Let me address those who are in their 20s, 30s, maybe even their teens. Maybe you're a young boy here that God has called you to missions. Do you have the right, do you have the card to live the American dream of a good education and a great salary and continual promotions, a wonderful retirement plan, cabin up in the mountains, three cars, free babysitting from grandma and grandpa down the road, Do you have that right? Sure you do. It's not sinful. Is there anyone here who will lay that down so that the Lydia's of the world and the Philippian jailer and his family might be saved? Why? So we can all go home. We're going to have to fight as Jesus fought. We're going to have to bleed as Jesus pled, and we are going to have to pray as Jesus prayed. We know that Jesus prayed often. We know that he prayed about important things. We know he prayed beautiful prayers. Father, glorify thy name, not my will, but thine. But I think sometimes we forget the wonder that Jesus, who was God on the earth, prayed. Why does God pray? More than that, what I find even more staggering is that Jesus, crucified, resurrected, ascended, sitting at the right hand of the Father with all the authority and all the glory and all the power of the pre-incarnation, God on the throne, how is he now spending his eternal time? Hebrews 7 verse 25, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. God on the throne is praying. God on the earth praying. What should his people be doing? Praying. But we don't feel like it, do we? Or we pray when we're all hyped up and then back at home when nobody's singing for us, we struggle. I'm not immune to this. A few weeks ago, we live in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. I was walking the streets at night. I was having a conversation with Jesus And I was just being honest. I said, Jesus, I don't feel like praying right now. I'm tired. Tired of praying. I'm tired of witnessing. I'm tired of discipling. I'm tired of of being a missionary. I'm tired of being a leader. I'm just tired. I want to run away somewhere and go flip hamburgers in Wyoming where nobody knows my name. No pressure. Nobody asks me for anything. I don't feel any of the weight of ministry. I just, I don't want to do any of it, Lord. And this is a problem because I write the books and I visit churches like I'm doing right now and tell people to bleed and to fight and to pray and I don't feel like praying. We got a problem, Jesus. What are we going to do? And the Lord brought my wife, Jennifer, to mind who likes tiny houses. Do you guys know what tiny houses are? I don't like them. I have no interest in tiny houses, but I have a lot of interest in my wife. So when she comes and says, hey, honey, look at this tiny house, I'm like, that's awesome. Show me another one. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about, right? So I said to Jesus, honestly, Jesus, I'm tired, and I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like doing any of that stuff, but I love you. And I know you're interested in this. I know you gave your blood that every tribe, tongue, people, nation might be represented around the throne. I know you're very interested in this. So I'm going to wrestle my rascally heart to what you're interested in, whether or not I feel like it. It doesn't matter if we feel like praying, it doesn't matter if we feel like being a missionary. Doesn't matter if we feel like praising the Lord. Doesn't matter if we feel like evangelizing. Doesn't matter if we feel like discipling anyone. You know what matters? Do we love Jesus? And do we want to go home? 
If so, we wrestle our rascally hearts to what he's interested in. And we say, Jesus, because we love you, we will do this. 1942, Winston Churchill was the prime minister in England. Difficult time in the war. England, of all of Europe, was the last one standing. And the coal miners go on strike. They provided the coal that kind of fueled the British war effort, and so it's a problem for Churchill. He goes to meet with them, gives a famous speech, and I'll paraphrase it this way. He simply said, we're going to win the war, and when we do, we're going to have a big old parade. At the beginning of that parade will come the Air Force who defeated the Luftwaffe and won the Battle of Britain. They'll be cheered. Then will come the Navy who took our supplies to our allies around the world, and they'll be applauded. Then will come the army who took their ground and spilt their blood and they will be praised. But at the end of all of that will come a band of dirty, disheveled, unknown men with soot on their faces and hands, the coal miners. They will be asked, where were you guys in England's darkest hour? And they shall reply, we were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal. We cut the coal that won the war. Revelation chapter seven, verse nine, tells us how it all ends. A multitude from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation around the throne. We're gonna win the war. And when we do, we're gonna have a big old parade. And at the front of that parade will come the apostolic fathers. And after that will come the saints of the patristic period. And then the wonders of the Middle Ages, the St. Francis, the Aquinas. And then will come the great missionary heroes of the great centuries. Taylor will be there. And William Carey will be there. And Trasher will be there. And Trotter will be there. And then will come the giants of our age. Billy Graham will be there. And all the men and women of God. And you know their names. And they will be cheered. And they will be praised. And they'll get their applause. And at the end of all of that, come a little old grandmother from Colorado, lives on her social security retirement check, gets up every morning, thumbs through her missionary prayer cards. Nobody sees her, but she's down on her knees praying. And they'll come, somebody from the Chinese underground church who's been in prison for 30 years, couldn't even talk to anyone because they were in solitary confinement. But every morning and every night in that cell, they'd get down on their knees and beseech the Lord of the harvest to send forth labors into the harvest field. There'll come a little boy from the Congo, never finished school, doesn't even have shoes, can't read, doesn't even have food on his plate. But he gets down on his knees and prays that Jesus shall reign wherever the sun doth its successive journeys run. His kingdom spread from shore to shore and they will receive their reward. Do you want to go home? And do you love Jesus? Then you're going to have to fight and you're gonna have to bleed, and you're gonna have to pray. Can I remind you that Jesus did not fight on his home stadium, but he left the comforts of heaven? When we're talking about fighting, apostolic nasty, that consecrated edginess for the worth of Jesus, his glory amongst all peoples, we're not talking about doing that at home. Is there anyone in this body today who will say, I'll take the fight to the gates of hell. I'll go where Satan has his throne. I'll take my family and I'll pay that price and I will represent Jesus amongst an unreached people group. Anybody here that's willing to fight an away fixture? What about bleeding? I want to thank you. This has been a great missions church all through the years. You've been very generous. But have you lived anemic? And would you be willing to be so sacrificial in your giving that other things are restrained because you want to go home? And all of us can pray. 
Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as pastor comes to lead us in prayer?